the root of consequence. Subsequent generations of historians will ever argue which underlying event was the true catalyst that brought about the seventh umbral calamity. However, it would be remiss to form an opinion without first observing those events which transpired in the autumn of the sixth astral era, culminating in that fateful battle on the plains of Cartano. The Battle of Silvertear Skies the fall of Alamigo did quick work in spurring the remaining free populations of Eorzea to action. The four city-states, Limsa-Lominsa, Uldar, Gradania, and Ishgard, formed an alliance in the year 1561 to deter the Galian Empire's advances into the region. The Shalians, however, did not join this pact. The scholars' abhorrence of war compelled them to dispatch a special envoy to Garlemald shortly after Alamigo's surrender for the sole purpose of diplomatic proceedings. These efforts were in vain, as the Galleons refused to meet the envoy at the negotiating table. Failing to reach a political solution, the forum decreed that the scholars would abandon the colony in the Dravanian hinterlands altogether and returned to their homeland across the northern wastes. Once Alamigo had been fully assimilated into the empire both politically and economically, the 14th Imperial Legion focused on hastening the progress of the Eorzean campaign. In 1562, the Imperial fleet accompanied by the mighty flagship Agrius forged its way into Mordona to Silvertear Falls. It was there that the Legion's armada encountered unexpected resistance, yet not at the hands of man, but of the worm Midgard Sormer, forgotten guardian deity of the lake. The great dragon called out to his kin, who pitted themselves against the Garlean's fleet in an aerial battle of epic proportions. The battle ended when Midgard Sormer and the Agrius collided and plummeted to the land, compelling the legion into a swift and complete retreat from Mordona. Not long after Midgard Sormer's demise, something unexplained occurred. Eorzea's beast tribes began summoning their own gods, the primals, into the corporeal realm. Dubbed icons by the Galleons who questioned their divine origins, these powerful creatures were deemed a threat to imperial rule and soon made a target of its armies. The 14th Legion Legatus, Gaius van Belsar, quickly observed the futility of engaging the icons in battle, as the vanquished gods were brought back time and time again through the use of crystals and prayer. Moreover, there were increasing reports that the blessings of these primal beings were transforming men into fanatics who would turn on their own kind in the names of their new rulers. Without a proper military strategy to address the Icon threat, Emperor Solus Zos Galvis would eventually order Baelsar to suspend the Eorzean campaign. It was also at this time that, after five years of preparation, the Charlians would embark on their exodus from the Dravanian hinterlands back to Old Charlian. In the span of a single night, an entire population vanished from the realm, leaving the remaining Eorzeans to tackle the myriad problems that still faced Eorzea. The Age of Calm The Holy See of Ishgard withdrew from the Eorzean alliance in 1563, unwilling to divert military power used fighting the Thousand Year Dragonsong War to efforts against the now idle Galian Empire. Citing the Emperor's suspension of their Eorzean campaign following the Battle of Silvertear Skies. With the invasion halted, Imperial forces stationed in Alamigo instead began construction of Baelsar's Wall between the newly annexed Girabanian territories and Gradania. Despite not knowing whether the wall was to serve as a means for the Empire to secretly prepare for a second invasion, or rather to simply quarantine a realm deemed plague by false yet deadly beastmen gods, the Holy See concluded that the Galian armies would not be mobilizing their forces anytime soon, and that the city-state's manpower would be better suited defending Ishgard against the recent rise of Nidhogg. 
With the cessation of Garlemald's expansion, Eorzea entered a brief period of respite from the hostilities that had plagued the region for so long. Without an enemy to engage, the Eorzean alliance lasted but in name, as its armies were dissolved and its resources reallocated. While the threat of incursion had subsided, the countless scores of infantry who had until recently lived, ate, and breathed war were left without work and without a cause. It was amidst this uncertainty that the Adventurers Guild was formed. Providing steady employment for displaced soldiers, the guilds not only helped these men and women reintegrate into society, but also provided the common folk with a means to complete tasks which had become too dangerous since the Imperial invasion and the rise of the Beast Tribes. The Age of Adventure was upon Eorzea. Adventurers' Guild branches quickly sprung up in all Eorzea's city-states, most often in or alongside places frequented by men and women looking for work, such as taverns or inns. These establishments transformed into more than simply places to wet one's throat or rest one's head. With the establishment of the guilds, they were transformed into bustling centers of exchange, where adventurers could share information while undertaking any number of tasks, from securing delivery routes through perilous territory to the culling of beasts raiding a farmer's livestock pens. The Circle of Knowing In the year 1562, the venerable Louis-Soir Leveilleux quietly gathered twelve of his pupils in the Charlian motherland for an ambitious undertaking. They formed the Circle of Knowing, a group of esteemed researchers and scholars known as Archons, dedicated to a single mission, the salvation of Eorzea. Weary of war and displeased with the Forum's unwillingness to intervene, the Circle vowed to take matters into their own hands through more clandestine means. Louis Swan knew that in order to dissuade the threat of a Gallian invasion, the Eorzean alliance would eventually have to bear its teeth. The sage dispatched his fellow archons to the three city-states, hoping they would be able to convince each of the respective leaders to re-establish the grand companies, consolidated centers of command which would combine military, economic, and technological resources to prepare for forthcoming disaster. While a new concept to many in the Sixth Astral Era, this was not the first time entities of this nature had been introduced to Eorzea. Fifteen hundred years prior, as the sun threatened to set on the Fifth Astral Era, these city-states called upon these self-same organizations to see to the evacuation of a realm beset with the rising waters of a calamity. Though reluctant at first, the leaders of the Sixth Astral Era were wise enough to see the benefits an alliance built upon the foundation of grand companies would provide their city-states. And thus, they cast their bitter quarrels aside for the better of their realm. The Circle of Knowing's efforts had not been in vain, and over the course of the next several years, they would ultimately play a significant role in the shaping of Eorzea's history. The Primal Threat it took time, however, for the city-states to warm to the Circle of Knowing's pleas for unity. The realm had lost a common enemy when the Imperial Legion retreated back behind Baelsar's wall, lessening the necessity of an all-encompassing alliance. City-states instead turned their focus inward to territorial disputes with the local beast tribes, disputes which had increased in frequency and severity since the Battle of Silvertier Skies. The need to quickly and efficiently deal with the Beastmen was reinforced by the fact the tribes had begun summoning ethereal entities considered by the tribes to be the deities from which their forebears claimed descent. These beings were widely known as Primals, or the First Beings. A particularly alarming incident involving a Primal arose in 1564, when Amalja from the plains of Pagalthan summoned their god Ifrit in an effort to reclaim Zanrak, ancestral lands sacred to the tribe. 
as their god wreaked havoc in southern Thanalan, laying waste to a mithril excavation site operated by the Amagina and Sons Mineral Concern, the tribe's army marched on outposts garrisoned by Uldar, overwhelming the unprepared soldiers and reclaiming the land as their own. This was, however, not an isolated incident. The Kobold and Sahagin tribes of Vilbrand had also been granted the secrets of summoning primals, and began doing so with increased frequency. Though much of the realm cowered at the Beastmen's newfound might, there were those who refused to be intimidated, and instead welcomed the opportunity for fame. It was during this tumultuous time that a death-or-glory band of braggadocios known as the Company of Heroes made a name for itself hunting down the self-proclaimed gods who plagued Limsa Lominsa. These acts of bravery, however, had little, if any, effect on the balance of power within the realm. If anything, Eorzea's adventurers found themselves trapped in a vicious cycle, slaying one primal only to see another rise again, just as powerful as before. It was the Circle of Knowing that first observed the environmental decay being caused by the repeated summoning of primals. The ceremonies required massive quantities of ether-based crystals, crystals required for the land to maintain elemental balance. The Circle, hitherto focused on saving the realm from Galian invaders, were quick to realize that there would be no realm to save if the beast tribes first bled the land dry of its ether. To tackle this new threat, the Archons enlisted the talents of the Students of Baldessian, a fellow Shalian organization dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge, to search for clues as to how the beast tribes inherited such knowledge. After moons of poring over dusty tomes and forgotten archives, the scholars discovered evidence connecting primal summoning to an enigmatic band of purportedly shadowless entities known as the Assians. Further study would be required to determine motive and the degree to which the Assians were involved, but time was not on the realm's side. Despite a lack of evidence, the Circle approached the esteemed leaders of Eorzea's city-states and informed them of the, albeit incomplete, results of their research. Much to the Circle's surprise, the reports were taken anything but lightly. The city-states recognized the gravity of the situation, and all agreed to act immediately on the information provided them. The Circle of Knowing had proved itself an indispensable source of knowledge, cementing itself as a centerpiece in the now realm-wide effort to neutralize the primal threat. A 1564 report by the Mithril Eye on the incident at Amagina and Sons Mithril Pit T3, wherein the site was attacked by a colossal fire-breathing beast, is the first summoning of the primal Ifrit recorded in detail. Revival of the Grand Companies The temporary respite from Galian hostilities appeared to be nearing its end by the year 1570, when the airship battalions of the 14th Legion moved to occupy the airspace above Belsar's Wall. Commercial flights in the area were cancelled indefinitely, as civilian airships operated by high-wind skyways were fired upon without distinction. Travel and trade in the region were severely disrupted, as merchants were forced to abandon the convenience of air routes for more time-consuming and dangerous land routes. This occupation of airspace, while concerning, did not appear to be a full-scale resumption of Garlemald's foray into the realm. That step was not taken until two years later, when Nail Van Darnus, legatus of the 7th Imperial Legion, marched his men into Alamigo, joining Gaius Van Belsar's 14th Battalions and effectively doubling the Imperial presence in the realm. Darnus's presence in the region confirmed the Eorzean leaders' fears, and provided them more than enough cause to embrace the Circle of Knowing's plan to re-establish the Grand Companies. Their purpose set, the city-states moved swiftly to pass laws granting power to the newly formed Maelstrom of Limsalaminsa, the Immortal Flames of Uldar, and the Order of the Twin Adder in Gridania.
The city-states held August ceremonies to celebrate the rise of the Grand Companies, hoping that the revelry would enkindle the spirits of the masses, compelling them to enlist. The events sponsored by the ruling elite were majestic affairs in which fiery-eyed battle marshals and generals would deliver passionate speeches to enraptured audiences in streets bright with the colors of the state. Full aware of their prowess in defending the realm, company officials appealed directly to adventurers, encouraging them to lend their arms to a cause most worthy and one most profitable. Divisions specially tailored to these skilled combatants were established by all three Grand Companies. The Maelstrom, the Immortal Flames, and the Order of the Twin Adder, each vying to lure the most formidable to join their ranks. Rise of the White Raven A sense of foreboding accompanied Nail Van Danis when the White Raven arrived in the Western Theater with his 7th Imperial Legion. The Legatus had been groomed for the military since childhood. His father, a decorated war hero in the battles that saw Garlemald become an empire, and was appointed to his esteemed rank shortly after the elder Van Darnus succumbed to a sudden illness. The young Legatus was, however, quick to make it clear that he would not linger long in the shadow of his predecessor. His first order as Legatus being the public execution of his father's closest advisers. This brash act provided the Legatus with a considerable amount of ill-gained notoriety within the Gallian capital, leading to rumors that Vandanus the Younger had contributed to his father's all-too-timely demise. However, Nail's social status and military rank essentially ensured that he would never be tried in any court. Bound by fear, the Seventh Legion grew into a force unequaled on the battlefield, and under the White Raven's leadership, nations within the eastern continent of Othard fell one after another. The Legatus had amassed scores of crucial victories in the Empire's eastern campaign, enough, in fact, to draw the eye of Emperor Solus Zos Galvis himself, who went on to publicly recognize Vandanus as a man of exceptional talent. The Emperor was well past his 80th name day by the year 1572, but old age would not dull his ambitions to unify the three great continents under Gallian rule. After amalgamating the political affairs of the occupied territories in Othard, he set his sights once again upon Aldenard and her vexing icons. When the Emperor declared the annihilation of the icons as one of his administration's top priorities, Vandanus was swift to seize upon the opportunity. He approached his liege with a proposal for ridding Eorzea of its false gods once and for all, using House Darnus' closely guarded knowledge of Allegan relics to succeed where others had failed. And so, the wheels of fate began to turn, leading Eorzea towards events that would eventually culminate in the seventh umbral calamity. It is widely believed Legatus Nail Vandanus earned the epithet White Raven from the sheen of his polished plate mail, but those who served under the mad commander claim it came from the ominous eye with which he watched his subordinates. Despite his rank affording him a position in the relatively safe rear guard, Vandanus preferred to join the advance ranks and fight at the fore with his gun halberd Bradamante. The Meteor Project Revisited in the 41st year of the First Emperor's rule, a decade before Nail Van Darnus' arrival on the Western Front, the Gallians attempted communication with the Lesser Moon Dalamud under the guidance of the Empire's principal engineer and Grand Minister of Industry, Midas Nan Garland. Dubbed Project Meteor, the operation's single test was conducted in the Imperial stronghold of Boja Citadel, using Allegan artifacts donated by House Darnus. The project was proposed by Nan Garland after Emperor Solus Zos Galvis had tasked the engineer with finding a solution to the icon threat. 
From records discovered within the artifacts, the Grand Minister was able to glean that the armies of Alag had also exchanged blows with the icons, eventually conceiving a method to overcome the beings. Detailed descriptions of that method, however, were conveniently missing from the records. A piece to the puzzle presented itself when Garland's research uncovered that the lesser moon Dalamud was not a natural celestial body gifted by the gods, but rather an ancient satellite of Allegan manufacture. Nan Garland surmised that within the moon's metallic nacelle slumbered a great source of untapped energy, forgotten power which could transform the moon into a weapon of absolute destruction if pulled down from the skies and unleashed upon Eorzea. The moon would serve as the Empire's own meteor. The meteor project was soon drafted, and the tantalizing prospect of an all-powerful weapon was met with broad approval within the Imperial Court. Mere days after receiving the Emperor's blessing, Nangarland would travel to the Galian city of Boja to conduct the first attempt to communicate with Dalamud. The immensity of the satellite's power was indeed confirmed that day, but at a disastrous cost. Nearly five millennia worth of amassed energy was directed by the moon to the Citadel's makeshift transmission tower. The beam emitted by Dalamud was so intense that not only the tower, but the entire city was evaporated in an instant. Efforts were made by the Imperial censors to hide the event from public scrutiny, but the vanishing of a major commercial center was too big a secret to suppress. News of the catastrophe quickly spread across Heidelin, and later became known as the Boja Incident. The loss of Midas Nan Garland, the lunar transmitter, and the entirety of the Allegan records stored at Boja Citadel seemingly sealed the fate of the Meteor Project. The Emperor declared he had no interest in power of such unpredictable nature and ordered that the project be dismantled immediately. Nail Vandanus, however, was not yet ready to abandon his obsession with the Meteor Project, refusing to allow the efforts of House Darnus to be left for naught. After learning of his deployment to Eorzea, Vandanus knew his wait was over and seized upon the opportunity to appeal to the Emperor regarding the merits of resurrecting the project, claiming he had discovered a means by which to successfully control Dalamud. After enduring a decade-long stalemate on the Eorzean front, the aged Emperor, impatient to solidify his legacy before his death, had once again become willing to entertain the notion of a realm-wide cleansing of the Beastmen and their icons. Thus, the second phase of the Meteor Project was commenced. Dalamud has long had a place in Eorzean mythos. Before its fall, the Lesser Moon was widely believed to be the loyal hound of the goddess Minfina, and as such appeared in many religious works of art. Needless to say, discovery of the Moon's true origin forced many of the realm's more devout denizens to question their faith. Solus Galvis made a name for himself as a decorated legatus in the Galian Republic, gaining popularity by proposing the integration of Magitech, previously only used in industry, into Garlemald's army and using it to subjugate Ilsebard's northern provinces. He had seen but thirty summers when he overthrew the Republic's ruling party and crowned himself Emperor in a bid to institute an imperial regime. His reign would continue for more than fifty years, until his death in the first year of the Seventh Umbral Era. A Three-Sided Struggle With the second phase of the Meteor Project underway, Nail Van Darnus proceeded to stockpile the energy that would eventually be required to facilitate Dalamud's fall. The Legatus asserted that for Meteor to succeed, the Empire would need to both acquire massive quantities of crystals, as well as secure areas found to exhibit high concentrations of ether. 
As the lesser moon turned deep crimson, the Seventh Imperial Legion deployed Magitek-equipped squadrons throughout Eorzea to harvest crystal nodes, whilst still others were tasked with seizing the Black Shroud's Toto Rock and the Zemile Darkhold in Kurthis. The Imperial Garrison also worked to excavate the remnants of Allegan technology left behind in Eorzea, actively seeking any records which could prove useful to Nail's engineers. The Grand Companies, though wholly unaware of the Seventh Imperial Legion's motives for this most recent incursion, sounded the alarms. Adventurers comprising the Company's ranks were dispatched to the Black Shroud and Curthis, and were successful in not only halting the Imperial operations, but reclaiming the occupied outposts. This handful of victories bolstered confidence in the Grand Company's ability to thwart the Imperial forces, providing light for a realm that had found itself plunged into darkness. Yet the Empire was not the only enemy with which Eorzea had to contend. Recognizing an increase in primal activity that appeared to coincide directly with the Empire's invasion, the Archon Louis Soi made the long journey to Eorzea with the intention of convincing the Grand Companies that if they sought victory, the Beast Tribes were not to be ignored. The Circle of Knowing proffered a solution. Use the adventurers to launch a two-tiered offensive. This plan, however, was not without its complications. Nail Van Darnus himself appeared before adventurers sent to slay Ifrit, drawing forth his halberd to slice open a vein of ether in the primal's cloister and force an untimely retreat. Soon after, the Mughals of the Black Shroud summoned a manifestation of a fabled murderous regent, while the Ixali called upon the Mad Garuda. The Circle of Knowing scrambled to gather intelligence on these primals and the tribes who had heretofore been unable or unwilling to summon them. Under the Archon's guidance, the adventurers were successful in their endeavors to temporarily quell the Beastmen's wrath. Yet, it became clear these were hollow victories, when it was discovered that the flood of ether which flowed from the primals upon their demise did not return to the land. It was instead being absorbed into Dalamud. The realm, it appeared, could not be stopped from sinking ever deeper into chaos. In the days preceding his death, Nail Van Darnus was completely consumed by his obsession with Dalamud. His manners became increasingly erratic, and he spoke quixotically of sacrificing his body and soul to the Red Moon. Some post-calamity discourses argue that it is highly likely that his sanity was being compromised by the influence of a primal. Infiltration of Castrum Novum While the Grand Companies were preoccupied with the primal menace, the 7th and 14th legions were nearing completion of Castrum Novum, a formidable outpost in the corner of Mordona, the Castrum would play a crucial role in Nail Van Darnus's Eorzean campaign, housing within its walls a replicated lunar transmitter. Little time passed before Castrum Novum caught the attention of the master engineer Sid Nan Garland, founder of Garland Ironworks and refugee from Garlemald, whose vast knowledge of Magitek weaponry had proven invaluable to the Eorzean leaders. Garland had learned from intercepted documents that some manner of transmission apparatus was being erected in the fortress, and knew all too well what the Gallians were plotting. For he was the son of none other than Midas Nan Garland, leader of the first phase of the Meteor Project, who perished in that fateful experiment at Boja Citadel. Conducting further investigation, Garland was alarmed to discover that the lunar transmitter was already operational, slowly but inexorably pulling Dalamud towards the atmosphere on a collision course with the planet. He appealed to the Grand Companies for emergency assistance, and the three leaders of the city-states spared no time in reforming the Eorzean Alliance, which had existed in name alone for so long. 
pooling their military resources for a joint operation. The mission to destroy the Lunar Transmitter was an ambitious one. A handful of platoons from the Grand Companies would lay siege to the Castrum's front gates as a diversion, while a party of formidable adventurers would infiltrate from behind, dispatching Imperial patrols before entering the inner chamber to destroy the ceruleum generators fueling the transmitter and render it useless. Morale was high in what was considered a pivotal moment in the Aeorsian Alliance's stand against the Empire, and the operation was a rousing success. The band of adventurers engaged both man and magitech within Castrum Novum's walls, and by their hand, the lunar transmitter went up in flames. It was during the Alliance's attack on the lunar transmitter that the Imperial Legion first deployed the unmanned magitech units known as vanguards. In addition to being utilized in offensive maneuvers against the Aeorsian Alliance, the vanguards were also placed in defensive postures along the walls of Castrum Novum. To kill a raven. The adventurers had accomplished their objective in deactivating the lunar transmitter. However, they were afforded scarce time to celebrate their triumph as Nail Van Darnis greeted the squadron in the inner chamber. He delivered what the histories would describe as a convoluted tirade at the Aeorsian Alliance's brazen attempt to foil his plans. Before vanishing from the castrum, Darnus delivered a final message to the adventurers that was alarmingly clear. The lunar transmitter was no longer needed to bring about Dalamud's fall. Astrological observations thereafter would confirm the Legatus's words. Despite the dismantling of the apparatus, the Lesser Moon continued its descent. Reconnaissance was immediately dispatched to ascertain Van Darnus' whereabouts, and it was soon revealed that he had fled in the general direction of Curthis. A council meeting of the Aeorsian Alliance was convened as some surmised that the Legatus had anticipated the storming of Castrum Novum and was already possessed of knowledge that would ensure the Red Moon's plunge to the surface. Uriange Augerelt of the Circle of Knowing contributed his own research, linking the Lesser Moon to ancient Alleg. The Archon's reports also spoke of scores of Alleghen ruins in the Fields of Glory, and the leaders of the Alliance had little doubts that the Legatus had set course for the Eastern Lowlands. Three reconnaissance units, one from each of the respective Grand Companies, were tasked with surveying the Lowlands for signs of Vandanus, but none survived a barrage of enormous pieces of meteoric fragments that rained down from the Lesser Moon. Observers in the area soon discovered that the trajectory of the rocks upon their comrades' positions was no natural phenomenon, but a deliberate assault. In their report to the Alliance, they spoke of how they witnessed a chain of crags floating above the land, the most central of which was emitting a single beam of light into the heavens towards Dalamud, in the selfsame wise that the lunar transmitter had at Castrum Novum. These were the Alleghen ruins from the Archon's report. So it was that the Council of the Aeorsian Alliance arrived at the conclusion that, for the sake of the realm's survival, Nail Vandanus must be stopped by any means necessary. A small group of adventurers rose to the task, and Sidnan Garland offered them passage to Riven Road, the center of the floating islets, aboard his airship the Enterprise. It was there that the adventurers would clash with the maniacal Legatus in a battle to the death. For all the White Raven's power and might, it would be his last stand, as the adventurers dealt the final blow. Upon his death, the squadron escaped from Curthus as the islets crumbled, stewing debris across the land. Garland's airship set course for Gradania, and the adventurers were greeted as heroes when the council heard the news. Vandanus was no more. The realm was saved. This jubilation, too, however, would prove short-lived. Harboring considerable misgivings about Garlemald's military approach to expansion, Sidnan Garland, Master Engineer and former Garlian Minister of Industry, and a number of his researchers defected, seeking asylum in Eorzea. 
The modern and lightweight Enterprise was designed and constructed by Garland immediately following his arrival in Eorzea. Desperation It was the Circle of Knowing who bore the dismal tidings. While the Allegan ruins had been destroyed in the battle with Nail Vandanis, the Red Moon remained unwavering in its collision course toward the planet. The headquarters of the Grand Companies were in pandemonium upon hearing the report, until Archon Louis Soi proffered an unorthodox, if not desperate, proposal to save the realm from destruction. Solemn Prayer The sage proposed that by invoking the twelve deities of the Eorzean pantheon, the realm might beseech the higher powers to repel Dalamud back into the heavens and seal away the Allegan relic's power. Needless to say, this notion was met with some criticism. Some pointed out that calling upon the Twelve in such a manner would make them no different than the savage beastmen who unleashed the primals upon the land. Others questioned whether summoning the Twelve would not render all of Eorzea's people mindless thralls to their influence, as was seen with the beastmen's gods. Archon Louis Soi assured his compeers that his proposed invocation was not akin to a primal summoning. On the contrary, he would search for a way to entreat the Twelve to merely lend their divine power to save the realm. The leaders of the Eorzean Alliance accepted the gamble that Archon Louis Soi set before them, yet none could deny an underlying feeling of despair. For history had proven time and time again that all eras of prosperity must eventually give way to calamity and chaos. It is said that in the moments before Bahamut unleashed his fury upon the realm, twelve like stones, used to invoke the power of the twelve on the eve of the calamity, were enveloped in a pillar of brilliant white light. Living on a Prayer As the Circle of Knowing completed preparations for the summoning, they beseeched adventurers to serve as its guiding light. These adventurers embarked on a pilgrimage to kneel before the marks of the Twelve and summon the power of the gods. The Grand Companies did their part by leading the residents of the city-states in fervent prayer to their patron gods as well. In this time of impending darkness, it was said that the entire realm gathered to entreat the heavens with one voice, an Eorzea, united by the litanies of its people. As adventurers and small folk alike proceeded according to Archon Louis Soi's plan, the Galian Empire stirred. The Eorzean Alliance received word that the remnants of the now leaderless 7th Imperial Legion were amassing on the plains of Cartano, where Dalamud was expected to make landfall. This information had come from the most unlikely of sources. Gaius van Belsar legatus of the 14th Imperial Legion, who appeared himself before an adventurer making his pilgrimage. The legatus relayed to the adventurer that the men of the 7th had become as fanatical as their commander had before them. They refused to accept Nail Vandanus' death and marched towards the plains at what they claimed was the behest of a man who no longer lived. As Van Belsar told it, the Seventh intended to secure the area around Cartano to ensure that none could forestall Dalamud's impact, and that they were ready to defend the plains with their lives. With Van Belsar's confession, the Eorzean Alliance faced a new crisis. To complete the summoning ritual that Louis Soi envisioned, the final invocation would need to be made directly beneath the Lesser Moon. It now became clear that the limited resources of the Grand Companies would first have to contend with the Seventh Legion, conquerors of the Eastern Continent and the Empire's elite. The stage was set, and the players took their positions. Cartano would bear witness to a decisive battle for the fate of Eorzea. The hopes and dreams of its people pitted against the ruinous desires of an army steeped in madness beneath the encroaching Red Moon. Gaius van Belsar sought to conquer Eorzea and bring its nations under the imperial yoke. 
It was for this reason that he bitterly opposed the Meteor Project, as proposed by his fellow Legatus Nail Vandanus, who would rather see the entirety of the realm burn. The Battle of Cartano The city-states of the Eorzean Alliance steeled themselves for their final engagement. The defense of Uldar was left in the hands of the Brass Blades and the Sultan's Sworn, as the immortal flames departed for Cartano from the Gate of Thal, east of the city. Passing through this gate was a time-honored tradition for Uldar's armies, for it was said that the Keeper of the Dead would grant death once to those who departed from his egress, thus allowing them to avoid a second death on the battlefield. Meanwhile, in Limsalominsa, the ink was barely dry on the Galadian Accord when the Maelstrom enlisted the help of powerful pirate factions in securing the plains under the Scarlet Standard. Notorious pirate bands such as the Bloody Executioners, the Kraken's Arms, and the Sanguine Sirens became free companies invested with full martial authority. The Twin Adders of Gradania departed the Black Shroud with Elder Seedseer Kani Senna, flanked by the Wood Wailers and Marksmen of the God's Quiver with a nominal contingent remaining behind to guard the city. Marching with the Grand Company's ranks were scores of adventurers, wielding mighty weapons they had won in their journeys. The armies of the Eorzean Alliance assembled in northern Thanalan, proceeding as one north to Mordona before pushing into the plains from the west. The remnants of the Seventh Legion placed themselves in formations on the eastern edge of the plains, while a detachment from Castrum Sentry would assault the Grand Companies from the rear. The commanders of the Eorzean Alliance countered the offensive by dispatching adventurers to keep the Castrum Sentry cohorts at bay, while their front lines advanced towards the Imperial host. Both sides had made their first move, and the Battle of Cartano had begun. As the main infantry of the Eorzean Alliance spread out to meet the Imperial forces head-on, Archon Louis Soi soon arrived and commenced his summoning of the Twelve from a promontory overlooking the battlefield. Here, he would endeavor to focus their divine powers on Dalamud. The vanguards of both armies clashed as the tide of battle ebbed and flowed in favor of the Alliance, then the Imperials, and back again. The Galleons, however, would soon completely overturn the odds when they deployed the next phase of their strategy. Ten score Magitech knights, each aboard their own Reaper-class Magitech battle armor. The offensive prowess of these newly developed war machines was overwhelming, and the Alliance's tentative hold on the front line began to falter. For the Eorzean Alliance, this was the first large-scale operation to combine the efforts of so many different forces. Commanders struggled to properly coordinate the movements of each unit, Ad hoc members of the Grand Companies, such as the pirate factions of Limsolaminsa and the Alamegans, serving among the immortal flames, employed tactics that differed from and often conflicted with one another. In that sense, it could be said that the vast army which faced off the Seventh Legion in Cartano was little more than a haphazard assemblage of units charging aimlessly forward with but a common purpose to bind them. The confusion increased tenfold when the Magitek Knights and their Reapers descended upon the Eorzean factions. Whatever orders had been handed down meaningless now, as every man fought for himself. The Alliance's numbers far exceeded that of the dwindled Imperial Legion, yet the lack of a cohesive strategy meant the full power of their forces was never brought to bear. The Galleons, while fewer in number, had at their disposal an array of advanced technology and years of conditioning under a strict military regimen. Once the Reapers had been deployed, the Seventh swiftly gained the upper hand. At this chaotic juncture, the adventurers proved the Alliance's salvation. Those who were sent to dispatch the Legion's diversionary force at Castrum Sentry made their belated debut and quickly joined the fray. They were no strangers to the maneuverings of Magitek weaponry, and reinvigorated the Eorzean side by forcefully advancing upon the Legion's Reapers. Through the adventurers' efforts, the Imperials were pushed back, allowing the Eorzean Alliance to claw its way forward once more. Groups of adventurers assembled in Mordona after answering a call to arms from the Eorzean Alliance. 
they would engage the Imperial Legion marching from Castrum Sentry in the vicinity of Silvertear Falls. The Elder Primal Bahamut None on the battlefield were prepared for that which brought the hostilities to an end. Upon quitting the firmament and entering the skies above Cartano, the red moon cracked, and from within the iron sphere emerged an ancient primal, the likes of which Eorzea had never seen. According to post-calamity research by the Archons of the Circle of Knowing, the primal that the Alligans enslaved within Dalamud was none other than the dreadworm Bahamut. Last summoned some five millennia prior by a horde of dragons on the southern continent of Mericidia when their motherland was invaded by the Alligan Empire. The vessel broken, and Bahamut released from his shackles, the colossal worm took wing to inflict his millennia of rage upon the realm. The Elder Primal tore away from Cartano and rained a fiery hell upon the land. In the end, there was truth in Nail Vandanus' incoherent ramblings addressed to the moon. The Legatus was aware of the monstrosity housed within Dalamud, and was heeding Bahamut's plea to be freed from his prison. Both the molten shards that rained down from Dalamud and the searing flames which spewed forth from the Dreadworm's maw were indiscriminate in their paths and war became an afterthought as friend and foe alike fled the battlefield in terror. As the men of both armies ran for their lives, Louis-Soir Leveilleux kept silent vigil over Cartano, unwavering in his effort to summon forth the power of the Twelve. Though Louis-Soir may have failed in his attempt to repel Dalamud back into the heavens, he would not allow Eorzea to bear the brunt of Bahamut's rampage, toiling on borrowed time to seal the Elder Primal away where he could raise the realm no more. Wielding the legendary staff Tupsamati, he drew from the great reservoirs of ether flowing forth from the land, channeling its strength together with the overwhelming prayers of the people. The power of the Twelve manifested itself in complex runes in the sky, in the most powerful sealing enchantment attempted in Eorzean history. The stone marks of the deities that were being nourished by the prayers of the Circle of Knowing were engulfed in pillars of light, becoming glowing spears that pierced the dreadworm, binding him in place as the runes confined him in a new prison. The plains of Cartano were bathed in the light of the Twelve, and it appeared that the ritual was complete. Despite the fact that all eyes were fixated upon the summoning of the Twelve, there appear to be no witnesses who can recall with certainty what happened after the Elder Primal was enveloped in the god's light. It is said that Archon Louis Soir's powerful spell, combined with the vast emanations of ether, had warped the memories of all who survived, an effect which lingered long after the Calamity. What is known for certain is that by the time the Light of the Twelve had dissipated, Bahamut was no more. At the same token, the faces of Eorzea's heroes, the adventurers by whose deeds Archon louis Soir's incantation came to pass, were lost to history. So it was that Eorzea plunged into the Seventh Umbral Era. Dalamud loomed in the skies above Cartano, bathing the plains in an eerie red glow, it is said that this ominous illumination, together with the chaos and confusion of war, led many to believe that the battle was being fought in the seventh hell itself. Several golden shackling mechanisms known as neurolinks were bolted into the corporeal flesh of the elder primal Bahamut. Information gleaned from research of historical artifacts suggests that they were but one of many devices fashioned by ancient Alag to subjugate and imprison beings of considerable power. Aftermath After Bahamut broke free from his fetters, the fields of Cartano descended into chaos. 
The commanders of the Eorzean Alliance ordered a full withdrawal to save as many lives as they could from the indiscriminate fury of the Primal. Military records state that General Raubon of the Immortal Flames was hesitant to order a retreat after the adventurers had regained the line, but he yielded at the insistence of his compeer, Kani Senna, of the Twin Adders. As their link pearls had fallen silent due to the massive ethereal disturbances attributed to Bahamut, the commanders were forced to deliver their orders by officers on foot. Maelstrom Command often claims that Admiral Melvir Blofusfin rode down to the battlefield herself on her beloved chocobo steed Victory to halt the pirate bands who bravely fought on even after the Primal emerged. Yet, there was no victory to be had at the Battle of Cartano. The Eorzean Alliance formally withdrew their companies from the plains, and the remnants of the 7th Imperial Legion, warriors known for their brutal conquests the realm over, scattered and fled in all directions. After the retreat, the troops of the Eorzean Alliance scaled back to northern Thanalan. It was there that the Immortal Flames established a camp, swiftly tending to the wounded and tallying the survivors among the ranks. The Maelstrom suffered a blow during the withdrawal when Admiral Merlvib sustained a grave wound that saw her removed from the battlefield. Serving in her stead, Grand Storm Marshal Einzar Slafferson gave the order that the Maelstrom fall back to Limsalominsa. The Twin Adders, however, would not return to the Shroud for some time, as Kani Senna volunteered her troops to form search parties and return to Cartano, providing assistance to friend and foe alike who lay wounded but breathing on those hellish plains. The compassion of the Elder Seedseer, herself an accomplished healer, would save no small number of men from their fates. Countless splinterings of Dalamud rained down on the battlefield at Cartano, composed of not only the moon's outer shell, but fragments of the inner modules which had confined the Elder Primal. Shards of Dalamud pierced the earth, producing a great fountain of ether that crystallized within moments the amber-colored, corrupted crystals now seen throughout the realm. These glowing talons remain a vivid reminder of the devastation wrought by the Calamity. A Most Remarkable Rebirth It was not only on the battlefield of Cartano that innumerable lives were lost to the Calamity. Many casualties are ascribed to the shattered Dalamud's flaming fragments which rained down upon the land from the peaks of Curthis to the deserts of Thanalan. No small number of civilians in Limsalaminsa perished in a tidal wave that engulfed the coastline, caused when a giant fragment of the fallen moon's outer shell plummeted into the nearby sea. Still many more perished to the raging firestorms that burst forth from the flaring ball of etheric energy unleashed by Bahamut. Just when all hope seemed lost amidst the chaos and destruction, the land came alive and showed signs of an inexplicable rebirth. The survivors of the calamity believe that Archon Louisois's invocation of the Twelve's power was the driving force which vanquished Bahamut, and could not be described as anything other than a miracle of the gods. Both speculation and rumor about the invocation would abound, with many speaking of a curious phenomenon in the sky above Cartano, a brilliant light in the shape of a phoenix. Archon Louisois's body was never recovered, though fragments of his legendary staff, Tupsamati, were discovered amongst the debris in Cartano by a twin adder search party. The devastation at the center of Bahamut's rage was absolute, making the details of what truly occurred on that fateful night subject to vigorous debate among scholars for generations to come. Next chapter, a chronology of the Sixth Astral Era.